Alex, good morning. How are you? I'm great. Thanks for having us, Peter. Always. Natalie, how are you? Yes, doing great. So when we were planning this trip, this was uh, this is the one we wanted to do most. We, for a while, realized that we have to get you two together. I don't know, have you guys spoken much outside of this? Not a little. Much, but we I've were been... on a panel with Warren Davidson uh, a couple yes. of years ago, which was First a lot of fun. First Texas Blockchain Summit, I made sure to get this guy. <laughs> yeah, and, and he um, talked about 6102 and he, he talked yep. about what the fuck happened in 1971.com <laughs> on stage. It was amazing to see a congressman talk about it. So yeah. fond memories of that. But yes, uh, I've been following her work and, and reading all the amazing stuff she's doing. So, so this will be fun. Yeah, yeah. So really, really glad to get you together. Uh, Natalie, it's been great to see what you've been getting up to over the last year, <laughs> becoming more and more involved, which is amazing. Um, how's it been for you? Oh, I'm busy. Uh, this is kind of my first, I would say, tour year. Um, so I've been doing a lot of speaking and traveling and um, trying to get the word out. Uh, and now it's time to actually produce some serious intellectual work. So I'm work working on a book and several wow. articles. So Exciting. Yeah. Can we, can we get an exclusive <laughs> on the book? What's it about? Can yeah, it uh, absolutely. Um, anthropology of value. So okay. Social scientific theory of value. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> Interesting. Is there a Bitcoin lens to it? There is. Bitcoin's a case study. All right. How long, do you th how long is that going to take? Oh, yeah, a year or two. <laughs> right. Well, listen, we're hosting a conference next year in uh, the UK in April. I'm coming. Well, Bedford, so there we go. We there's, the f <laughs> there's the first exclusive. Alex is one of our keynotes. We're going to try and get you over as well. But listen, look, really right. glad to get you together. Alex, yeah. um, I don't know how you do it. Like, we're convinced there are Alex Glastin clones. <laughs> you are, like, there's another one back at home working on a book right now where you're here. Well, I don't know how you do it, man, but um, another fantastic book. Congratulations. We covered this topic before, but we, me and Danny said, now the book's out, it'd be good to cover it again. Mm -hmm. Also wanted to bring Natalie in because me and Natalie have had a couple of great interviews and we just think her understanding of geopolitics as well mm -hmm. would add to this conversation. But um, let's do a, like a t almost like a TLDR because we did the previous interview. We'll have it in the show notes so people can check it out. But mm -hmm. tell people what this book's about. Yeah, so obviously when you start looking at Bitcoin, uh, you start looking at the world a little differently, you start asking different questions. And one of the big questions that people don't ask traditionally about the international monetary system is, is, is basically very much at all about the IMF and World Bank, which is weird. Meaning there isn't like a Michael Lewis style, big short style book about the IMF or World Bank. There's no curiosity culturally in them. Um, they're not very approachable subjects. And yet they're probably two of the most important financial systems or institutions in the world. And when the US and its allies created the Bretton Woods system in 1944, they were two of the pillar organizations that the world was built on. So for me, you know, I, I just started digging around last summer a little bit because people were like, you know, slipping me things here and there about the IMF. And I'm, I'm like, is this true? Is this, could this really be true? And, and I had seen that they were involved in the French monetary colonialism uh, that I'd studied and, and written about and spoken about because the IMF basically was a tool that France used to, to devalue currency and kind of restrict these economies in Africa. So I dove in and I just, I couldn't believe what I started to, to, to read about when I found all these old <laughs> JSTOR articles. I would go and read uh, Courtesy Sci-Hub. There's this like, amazing Kazakh communist woman who runs this website called Sci-Hub where you can get free access to all the world's academic articles, which are normally behind these crazy paywalls. So please donate to her. Yeah. You can donate Bitcoin to her. You can't, Absolutely. You can't use fiat because they close it down. <laughs> but it's, uh, no, it's amazing. You read like about, there's like great pieces from like the 1950s, 60s, 70s, 80s that are just buried and people have forgotten. But there's vivid details about what the IMF and World Bank did and, and, and continue to do. And that's why the book is called Hidden Repression is because the, the repression is hidden. And I guess just the, the zoom out TLDR would be that I think that um, it's true that Western societies, the US, UK and its allies have been successful because of our values. This is entirely true, for sure free speech, private property, freedom of assembly, freedom of religion. There's all kinds of cultural productivity stuff. Um, it's true, we, we, we should be proud of those things. But what people don't talk about or don't know about is that we've also been successful because we've stolen a lot of resources and labor from poor countries. And that's just like left out of the history books. You just don't read about that. And it's especially left out of the economics history books. So this, that, that's kind of like 
a simple way of explaining kind of the book in a nutshell. Um, and we, we can go from there, but that's that's kind of the jarring reality is, is, is that we, we, we rely on exploiting um, poorer nations. And that's just kind of a very uncomfortable truth. And whilst these are in international institutions, how much are they really American institutions? Oh, very much so. I mean, look, again, the U.S. Um, won the discussion at Bretton Woods in New Hampshire at the very beautiful hotel that I've been at. Uh, and uh, they, they, they out-muscled Keynes and the British and all the other delegates, and they got their way. The others wanted to have this uh, internationally managed kind of basket of different currencies to be the international uh, trade settlement uh, medium. And, and we said, no, it's going to be dollars backed by gold. Um, and, 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 and we got to have the IMF and World Bank headquarters in Washington, D.C. They're not somewhere else. They're right there in D.C. They're connected, which shows you how close the two organizations are. Um, and, and they were originally set up to be the lender of last resort for the world's financial system. I mean, these are reasonable things. And, and, and then a development bank to pay for things that private capital didn't want to fund in war-torn countries. And for the first few decades, that's what they did. And, and you know what? Like, I think even in a sound money standard, these could exist. Like countries could pull together resources, you know, to put out a fire in case something goes wrong in a country. Um, at the beginning, they, they were created to, to stabilize exchange rates. At least the IMF was, the job was if a country like Britain, for example, or France fell out of its balance of payments um, and, 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 and couldn't afford to, to import anymore um, and, and, and basically went bankrupt, the, the IMF existed to go in and stabilize that country because the goal of Bretton Woods was to make sure that the 1930s didn't happen again in terms of a breakdown in global trade. Like the spice must flow was like the mm -hmm. idea, right? That's why they exist. They, these neoliberal institutions that, that were created were, were meant to keep global trade going. And um, at the beginning, that's what they did. They helped Western countries recover from World War II. They, they would step in and stabilize and it, usually an advanced economy when it, when it started to have a problem. Um, and the World Bank would like fund infra in, you know, infrastructure in Japan and Europe, basically. And I don't think there was like malice necessarily there. And, and they did um, do what they, you know, what they were promised to do. The problem is that in, when Nixon took us off the gold standard, um, all these economists were like, why, why do we need the IMF anymore? I mean, it was supposed to stabilize exchange rates, but we're no longer pegged to anything. So why do we need it? So what ends up happening, in, in at least in my thesis, is that the bank and the fund pivoted like late 60s, early 70s um, from stabilizing and helping the rich countries get back on their feet to targeting and exploiting poor countries. And this is, this is like a transition that happens at the end of colonialism. Like colonialism is, is ending in, in around 1960. Uh, it's basically declared extinct at that time. There's like a couple countries that persist, but basically like you had this conveyor belt of cheap resources and goods coming into the heart of the Western economic uh, empire, Britain, for centuries, you know, colonial, colon I mean, and going back even further, I think about the conquistadors. I mean, what were these empires doing? What was colonialism really all about? It was about going to get the gold and cheap stuff from elsewhere to input into the British and French economies, for example, uh, to raise quality of life at home in London or Paris. I mean, that's what colonialism was all about. And, and the amount of stuff they looted from India was just unbelievable. I mean, a lot of British people don't understand how much British civilization is thanks to things stolen from India. I mean, it's unbelievable. I mean, India was the richest country in the world and it was reduced to like basically a subject of this small island in, in the North Sea, it's unreal. So um, that started to break down. And like when you have a breakdown in a conveyor belt of cheap labor and resources, you start to have economic problems. So that's one major reason why the Great Depression happened. That's something I advance in the book uh, off the back of uh, some interesting thinkers is that um, one of the reasons we had the Great Depression and so much economic trouble is because the, the colonial flow started to like basically trickle and, and stop. Um, you could say the same thing about the 1970s. Uh, one of the reasons we had so much inflation in the United States is because we lost control over energy. Like energy used to be controlled by Western companies through the Seven Sisters, Western corporations. Um, because of the end of colonialism, we had to give up control over energy production to these countries that actually owned the oil, OPEC, and they decided to raise the cost, right? So the end of colonialism meant, meant uh, more inflation here, economic crisis here. You're almost seeing like another wave of that now where like 
globalization's breaking down, right? And you're gonna see economic crises in the West. So this is history rhymes, right? Um, but basically my thesis is that you have this colonial drain dynamic <clears throat> that's been very, very lucrative for Western countries. And the, we figured out how to replicate that without the worship and the sword and the bayonet. We figured out how to do it with debt. And that's what we started to do with the IMF and World Bank. They're not the only actors in the system, but they're very, very important. And I just, I'll finish with this before we get Natalie's thoughts on this, but I think a lot of um, people on the left have been like criticizing the IMF for a long time. You know, confessions of an economic hitman, shock doctrine, there were tons of conferences and movements in the eighties and nineties. Like they were mainly Marxist leftist folks, um, but there's some libertarian criticism too, that's really good in the nineties. The problem with, with, with a lot of this criticism is it basically says the IMF and World Bank are like, wasteful, cor corrupt, bureaucratic, um, waste of taxpayer money, and, and they hurt poor countries. This is all true, but they miss, I think the biggest thing is that they're incredibly beneficial for us, the West. It's not just that like they're inefficient or corrupt or that they hurt poor countries, that's true, but they benefit us. And they do that in three ways. Interest payments, like they make billions of year off interest. Like rich countries give money, to the IMF and World Bank, and then that money is deployed at a very high cost. Like so, there's a spread, there's a cancel on effect, basically. State level loan sharks. Absolute predatory lending is number one. Number two is the is the cheap resources and, and labor I described. I mean, basically uh, you get um, all kinds of minerals, uh, fossil fuels, uh, timber, uh, cheap agricultural products. And then you also get like deflated labor, meaning the labor in these countries, the, the wages are, are brought down by IMF policies. So to just give you an idea, in 2015, there was a study done where it's estimated that about 50% of all of the resources we consume in the West are from global South countries and thir about 30% of the labor. So just think about it this way. What if we woke up tomorrow and we had half the resources and we and our and the cheapest end of our labor spectrum was gone, meaning like the cheapest one third of the labor that we use to make our stuff and push our societies forward every day was gone. We'd have massive fucking inflation. So you have, that, that's the idea is like, the, the, we, we rely on these countries to subsidize our way of life. And then the third way it's lucrative is control. I mean, we get political control over these countries and we engineer them so that they're dependent on us. This is done mainly through agriculture. Like Africa imports 85% of its food. It should be exporting food. It should be a net exporter. But basically what we do is in the West, we highly subsidize our agriculture so that, you know, you know, we end up exporting food and then we withhold that food if a country misbehaves. This is, we've done this many times. So we want it to be food sovereign. So we like change the rules of international trade uh, and, and we subsidize industries to crowd out these third world countries. So they end up having to basically uh, do monocrop agriculture and, and raw materials exports to earn dollars so they can pay back their debt. And, and this, is, this is the whole thesis is that, uh, you know, these institutions are not just harmful for poor countries, that they're very, very beneficial for us. Natalie, we, um, we recorded a show based on an article you wrote, The Refounding of the American Dream. Yeah. And we covered a lot of the collapse in the values and the almost corruption within the US politics. But I wonder if the the parallels that are exactly, I mean, there's exact parallels between what's happened within the US government and what's happened within these institutions. It almost feels like it's the same incentive models yeah. which have become aligned. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so I loved Alex's um, historical summary. Um, there's uh, another dimension to that, which is that after the Second World War, um, the United States foreign policy was um, completely consumed by the fight against communism. And so our rebuilding efforts um, for allied countries and the so-called third world was always packaged as how can we fight communism by providing this aid? And so like USAID, the primary government led aid organization was actually set up to fund anti-communist um, activity politicians um, in countries that um, say weren't the res recipients of like fully interest-free loans, like the Marshall Plan, mm -hmm. which we basically, we gave that to our friends but yeah. if, you, if you weren't in the inner circle, then you got loans or you got USAID, which was in effect 
military aid um, for anti-communist factions, but under the under the guise of philanthropy. Um, and so we we subsidized the um, economic growth of countries around the world in two ways. Um, or more than two ways. One is, you know, through the establishment of these international lending institutions. Um, one is through uh, direct aid, USAID, and another is through the balance of trade. Um, so the United States chose to actually run a structural deficit vis-a-vis -vis many of the countries that we wanted to recruit as allies in the Cold War so that they could begin earning dollars and build up an economy. But we didn't do this equally or evenly or with some kind of consistent application of principles. And so to Alex's point, you know, we have some industries that we just sacrificed in the United States, like manufacturing. Like we basically gave that to other countries. Other industries like agriculture, we have protected very mm -hmm. je jealously and vociferously. And so we've kind of picked and chosen winners. The other, the other element to this international uh, lending structure is that by the late 1970s, you had an overclass of hyper-wealthy individuals um, in, in many countries around the world, but particularly in the Gulf as a result of the growing oil wealth. And if you have, you know, billions of dollars, you can't just park that in cash. Like, you have to find financial institutions and vehicles who are able to securitize that for you and create investment contracts so that that money is making money for you um, so that you're not, you know, precarious. And as we were talking about with Lynn and Jeff the other day, there literally isn't enough, like, cash collateral in the world if if everybody wanted to redeem mm -hmm. their balances. And so these lending programs were established in part through some of the sovereign wealth that was generated by resource-rich countries who, yeah, they were doing dollar recycling by, you know, uh, plugging some of that back into the U.S. economy, but they literally couldn't do it with all of their money. They had so much money. And so some of that went to these international lending institutions mm -hmm who then had to deploy that capital. And so how do they do that? Well, by creating loans. Well, the rich countries don't need loans. The poor countries need loans. Yeah. Um, and so there is a class element to this as well, where the wealthiest people in the world are constantly in search of safe places to park all their capital in a way that's going to return capital. Every, you know, every wealthy family has a hedge fund or multiple hedge funds. Um, and that has created a, a fully striated economic system. Hmm. Um, Danny and I were discussing this beforehand, and we were discussing the idea that at a nation level, you have uh, essentially, you have different classes. And it's almost like at an international level, you now have uh, the uh, bourgeoisie and the proletariat, and, and there's no upwards mobility available to these smaller countries because they're constantly being held back. Mm. Yeah, well, they're stuck in what are known as debt traps. Yeah. And I, it's interesting, the, the petrodollar system is, is very relevant to this. Um, it's almost like the, the foreign lending bubble that we still live in um, is almost like an outcome of it. And I'll explain, like, basically what happened was uh, due to the, the end of colonial control over energy, you know, OPEC was able to raise the price of oil, like, dramatically. And as the, Natalie was saying, um, not just individuals, but but like sovereigns in the Gulf had this just enormous, historically crazy amount of cash in the early to mid '70s. So much so that they didn't know what to do with it. They couldn't just like hold it in cash. They had to go put it somewhere. Um, and even though the U.S. had just basically been on the other side of a war uh, with with some of these Gulf countries so, over Israel in '73, Nixon and Kissinger were like. We, we, we got to get somebody to buy our debt. <laughs> like this was like a problem. Like right. the U.S. dollar lost uh, fifty percent of its value versus the German mark in the three years after Nixon took the dollar off the gold standard. Like the dollar had a major crisis. We had huge inflation in the United States. Uh, obviously, a lot of it was tied to energy. Um, a lot of it was tied to just our spending, our reckless spending in, in uh, Vietnam and on our social programs. But basically, we needed to like find someone to buy our debt to help bring those interest rates down. Um, so basically, we hired a guy off Wall Street named William Simon, um, 
he became treasury secretary. He flew out to Saudi Arabia. This was all documented. And um, they ironed out this deal where the Saudis would, again, price oil in dollars and then take the, the pet, petrodollars, just the dollar earned by selling oil. Um, they, they would take the petrodollars and invest them um, either into the, the growing uh, euro dollar banking system in, in, in Europe or, or into the American banking system. And then, and, and as she was saying, a lot of this ma then made its way into these IFIs, these international financial institutions, and were lent to the third world. So in a lot of ways, the petrodollar system juiced up the, the banking system in a major, major way. Um, and then that led to this like pro just crazy amount of lending to, to poorer countries. So by the end of the 70s, you had a 300, 400% increase in loans to, to Latin America, Africa. You had, I mean, we talk about like bubbles, like the stock market bubble, the dot-com bubble. I mean, you had like mom and pop, small banking institutions in the United States in the middle of nowhere, making loans to countries in Africa. Like mm. it was crazy. So there was this huge, huge bubble and then, and, and, and then it popped. So what happened was um, it, we had major, major inflation throughout the seventies. And then we brought in Volcker and much like Jay Powell's doing today, he, he tried to kill inflation inside the United States by raising interest rates really, really aggressively and really quickly. So, you know, he raised rates all the way up to close to 20%. Um, and uh, this did indeed, you know, reduce inflation over time in the U.S. But what it also did is it is it popped this gigantic sovereign lend, lending bubble to the third world, and all these countries, all of their debt that they've acquired from IFIs uh, like the World Bank and and, uh, and and the IMF are dollar denominated, and and they print weak currency. So when when the cost of capital goes up and the dollar gets stronger they can't afford to pay anything back. So Mexico was the first one to go. They defaulted, I think it was in 82. Um, and then what happens is like, everybody's caught with their pants down because the US banking system was so over levered on, on loans to these poor countries um, that we had to go bail them out. This is a very important point. We didn't bail out Mexico in the 80s or in 94. We didn't bail out the Asian countries during the Asian financial crisis. We didn't bail out the Europeans in the 2010-11 sovereign debt crisis. Um, we didn't bail out Russia for in the, in the late 90s for, for altruistic reasons. This wasn't to save the Mexicans and Russians and Indonesians. This was to save our banks that had lent to these climates. And if we didn't do it, then what would have happened is those countries would have defaulted and then every, every loan is an asset on a Western bank's balance sheet, right? In this arrangement, and that would go to zero. And they don't like that very much because that causes a massive reduction of their balance sheet. So the incentives were for our system, uh, which again is backed by these Western creditors, our incentives were to say, look, we can do one of two things. We can accept a bankruptcy and we can write down the loan or we can just make another loan. <laughs> and, and they much rather would, would, would make the loan. Like this is the game, this is why it's a debt trap. So because of this dynamic, you had exponential rise in um, third world debt from the early 70s to today, to today. It literally is an exponential chart. I mean, you had mid-sized countries, lar large global South countries, even like Bangladesh, let's say, who would maybe have $100 million of external debt in the early 70s. Now they have $100 billion of external debt. And I mean, people knew that this was never gonna be paid back. I mean, it's not designed to be paid back. It's a Ponzi scheme. It's it, the only possible way all these countries can pay back their debt is with more debt. And, and that's how the system keeps moving along. And that's why it's a debt trap. And it's very similar to like a drug addict, actually. Uh, there's a lot of people have made this, this comparison, but it's, it's very much like these Western lenders at the sovereign level are, are drug dealers and the, the drug is debt. And these poor countries, which are, you know, again, are almost always led by dictators or unaccountable rulers. They're the addicts and they, they, there's, no one, there's no one trying to take them to therapy or to rehab, it's not, it's not happening. So um, there's no incentive to change. There's just more and more and more debt. Um, and that's one of the reasons why there's so, such limited international financial mobility and why there's such great inequalities in the system is because you have all these different currency regimes and like we live in the dollar system or the pound system, and that's kept separate from like the Naira system or the, or the peso system. And that allows us to like crush the peso or the Naira to squeeze it uh, to get more value out of it for us. But if we all, and this is where Bitcoin comes in and in the book at the end and, and what I'm gonna say later on stage, like if, if we're all in one open neutral monetary network and language, you can't quite have this disparities in labor forces around the world. I mean, there will still be disparities, but they'll, they'll be basically like arbitrage, like it'll tighten a little bit faster.
um, if everybody's using the same currency, it's not possible to have this system. I mean, think about Africa today. It has 45 different currencies. What a nightmare is that? Imagine if each state in the United States had a different currency. We'd be like so much more inefficient. Um, that's what Africa is. So if, if it could be united around one currency, I think, I think we could change the world. When you talk about these leaders, these dictators mm -hmm. being the addicts, yeah. but isn't there a different spin to this in that they're open, well, I say openly, but they're corrupt. Mm -hmm. Another huge loan can come in. They know they can skim that off well, the top. Well, they don't have to pay it back personally. Yeah, so they, they get they get to skim off the top and export the totally. misery. Totally, they take 20%. Yeah, and they export the misery <laughs> no, no, no. to the country. Totally, and, and like let's say, and to Natalie's point, a lot of these leaders were Cold War allies. Not all of them, which was really interesting. It, it, it The Cold War paradigm is, is a necessary but not sufficient way to, to explain this because we ended up giving a lot of money to leftist leaders too through these institutions. So I think there's like the Cold War is a very important lens, but there's a bigger lens. And that's just the like powerful exploit the weak, like mm -hmm. biblical stuff. Like that's that's just the bigger picture. And that's why we were giving money to like Cochescu in Romania, Mengistu in Ethiopia, Nyeri in Tanzania, the CCP. I mean, the IMF was funding the CCP. So, so you can't just use the right left paradigm to explain this. It, I mean, there's a good book called Perpetuating Poverty that came out in the 90s about the IMF and World Bank. And there's a line in there about, <clears throat> you know, the IMF never met a dictator it didn't like. Mm. And, and that's what sent me down this rabbit hole in the first place. But I mean, it's true that like, it takes two to tango and there's there, there has to be someone to accept the loan. I mean, the problem with this whole system though, from the beginning has been that none of these leaders accepting these loans were, were democratically elected or very few of them were. Um, and that the, these loans were were basically illegitimate. Like the, like, and when the leader was toppled, like for example, in the Philippines in the eighties, they got rid of Marcos who had, who had borrowed billions and billions from the IMF and World Bank at high interest rates. It's not like the IMF goes, okay, you guys can have like a, a jubilee. You guys can have a write off. No, they're like, <laughs> you still owe this. And the people of the Philippines were like, wait, but we didn't borrow it. And the IMF says, I don't care. This is what you owe. Uh, and, and so 40% of the national earnings of the Philippines, the year after Marcos was ousted, went to paying back his debt. So it's like this so, uh, burden that they carry for decades. But why at that point would they not then default on the debt? Well, uh, the, the, again, like the new leader comes in and what are their choices? I mean, if you have to think about it this way. If you default on your debt, it's not just that, um, you know, people in suits rush in to convince you that here's more money. That's very appealing. But it's also like, you know, there's also not just political, but there's market stuff here. Like if your country is defaulting, no one wants to do business with you, mm. right? So these are very tough choices. There's no, there's nothing easy here. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, no, absolutely. And so one of the, one of the toxic elements of, of this structure is that um, the uh, multilateral institutions um, had so um, indebted uh, many countries uh, rising in the mid 20th century post second world war um, and propped up these unaccountable dictatorial regimes um, who actually were, were never going to pay back this debt. And so um, no private lenders um, or even other countries wanted to lend to these countries either. Um, and so like the alternative always became another multilateral institution. Like the IMF was the lender of last resort because there was no other lender. And so they kept coming back to the well, the IMF, because what private company or what other government would want to do a bilateral loan to these dictatorial kleptocratic regimes? Well, they wouldn't. And so that then further entrenches the cycle. How much of this is malice and how much of this is a poorly incentivized system? Because I could imagine, that, I don't imagine you go to the World Bank or the IMF and they're full of evil people. No, I think it's very much the banality of evil thing. Like most people who work at these institutions, they want to go change the world for the good. I think mm -hmm. overwhelmingly. Um, look, I think a lot of this is like an outcome of our way of life and system. It's not necessarily like conspiracy where you get around a table and say, we're going to screw these people over. Uh, I think it's more of an outcome of the way of life we have. Um, but some of it is definitely ranging from uncaring to malice. I mean, you can't be, the amount of money we gave Mobutu and Zaire hmm. and what he did to the Zairean people. I mean, we were not ignorant of this. We knew exactly what was going on. And that, that, that is anywhere from uncaring to malice to evil, basically, like our support for him. I mean, w w this is just a shocking stat. I'll share it later today. But um, when structural adjustment, which is, which is 
basically the process through which a, a country, when they borrow money from the IMF or World Bank, they have to uh, follow conditions, conditionality. And those things are often like currency devaluation, raising taxes, ends to subsidies on food and energy, basically like sending the country into, rece- into a recession. And you have to think about it this way. They're trying to like cut any expenses. Um, these, these countries in the global South aren't allowed to have free healthcare, education, retirement. That's only for rich countries. For these countries, when we go in as to develop them, we say, oh, no, 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 you can't have any sort of state spending on anything um, because we need you to export cheap stuff to us. I mean, it, it is malicious, I think, because, because of the double standard. I mean, the UK has free health care, et cetera, et cetera. But none of the British colonies, they were never allowed to have those things. So this is a huge double standard. And I'm not like, I'm a classic liberal. Like, I think that probably subsidies on these things are probably not a good idea. But you can't have the powerful country subsidizing everything and then all the weak countries having nothing. I mean, that causes terrible unequal exchange is, is what it's known as. So, I mean, the, the, the cycle just gets deeper and deeper and deeper. And I, I think there is... I mean, malice here, and, and just to finish with the Zaire example, 1972 is when the structural adjustment really kicked in, and 1995 is, is when the conflict started to break out that, that ended up deposing Mobutu. But he was in power that whole time, and, and they accepted more than uh, close to $2 billion of, of money from, from the IMF, and, and then, of course, a lot more from other IFIs. But the point is that during that time of adjustment, uh, the Zaire the currency that they used there was, was worth $1 in, in 1972. By 1995, it was worth one billionth of a dollar. And, and that's, just, that's just the squeezing of the national life, like economic lifeblood <clears throat> and the constricting of it. The, the real GDP of this country, even though the population exploded, declined by 40% during structural adjustment. So what happens is when you have precipitous declines in GDP while your population's growing, people die, tons of people die. Like a good example based on Mexico, which is like a pretty good proxy for most of these countries. It's a large, medium-sized, large global South country. <clears throat> when there's a 2% decline in GDP, the mortality rate goes up by 1%. So you can start, you can start thinking about a 40% decline in GDP. So, I mean, tens of millions of people were killed by these policies, but no one will ever go to prison. There'll never be any justice. It's, it's like Larry Summers was head of the World Bank's economic wing in the, in the early 90s. He was like the chief economist. He's on Twitter telling us what to do. He was in the White House. He's going to live in a mansion. He'll retire nicely. Like none of these people will ever face any justice for what they did in these policies, which is of course an outrage, but like it is what it is. I mean, we're, we're not going to be able to take them to the, the Hague or whatever. Um, I think that Bitcoin is a way out. It's interesting. And, and maybe there'll be some justice there in some ways, but um, it is just something that we must reckon with. Mm-hmm. Hi, uh, Natalie. We had um, we had an interview uh, this week where s- part of the conversation was just discussing the economic success of the U.S. And they said, "Well, why, you know, why do you think um, the U.S. is such a successful economy?" And they they wanted me to say property rights. Mm. And yes, I think that is part of the picture. Everything you brought up at the start, Alex. Mm-hmm. I said, "Sure, I know what I know what you want to say, but ever since I've." discuss with Alex what's happened with the IMF and the World Bank, the economic imperialism, I think a lot of the success has come from that. And, you know, if the UK has also benefited from it, I actually just feel a lot of shame Mm. in this. Mm -hmm. And so I don't know how to reconcile the two, Mm -hmm. but do you think we are, do you think we're too ashamed to admit this? And do you think we should be making this part of the conversation? I mean, does, does, do countries like the US and the UK actually have to take responsibility for this or will they ever? Oh, that's that's a yeah. such an important question. The logic of power is to run out the clock. Um, so like Alex was saying, hmm. the powerful people who are responsible like directly and personally for specific atrocities, um, sure, they're part of a larger structure, they're part of a machine, but they have participated actively in that machine. Um, their logic is to simply kick the can, um, create FUD, um, you know, fight court battles, um, exit, make themselves inscrutable until they die, um, and to secure their inheritance and, and future generations in such a way that they're largely insulated from, from any blowback. Um, and so then the question becomes, like in the Philippines, well, who is responsible 
Marcos is dead now. The people didn't take out these loans. I mean, the American people can be convinced to support various wars, Mm -hmm. but they're not the ones directing the national security apparatus to like, okay, let's go for Angola now. Okay, now let's let's do Iraq. Okay, now we got to go um, to Indonesia. Like, they're not the ones coming up with these plans. They are conscripted into strategies that they don't have really any visibility into. Um, and so there is there is absolutely a truth telling that has to happen about the colonial past of. The United States, the UK, but I mean, the UK has faced that its yeah. colonial past with India. Like yeah. they have faced but that. But the question dealt with that. is, what is to be done? Yeah, I so think that's that's really what you're getting at. So now that we've told the truth about the role, let's say, of the United States in um, in oppressing and extracting resources from these other countries, now what do we do as a people? Because that is what you and I and people in power today have agency over. Um, and that that gets at the question of who are we as a republic? What values are are we going to be guided by, and what are our policy priorities going to be? Yeah, and I would just say that. Look again, we have a lot to be proud of, and we we have a lot to be ashamed of. I mean, it's a, it's a nuanced picture. Um, but I think that one thing that's distressing is to see people. Uh, if, you, if you think about the, like, why are you successful? You have values uh, that are harmonious and productive and based on freedom, right? Uh, and then you have exploitation, right? But both domestically and abroad. I mean, let's not forget the, the history of uh, African-Americans in the United States. Um, but the point is that the sad part is instead of realizing this and, and, and as Americans confronting our history and saying we need to be less exploitative and focus more on our founding values, you see a lot of people, a lot of Americans, a lot of Bitcoiners, a lot of libertarians simping for dictators. And this is just the worst because the enemy is exploitation. And dictators are, are negative on both counts. Not only are they um, exploitative towards foreign countries, but they're also exploitative versus their own, all of their own people. So it's distressing to see people um, sort of cheering de-dollarization for as if that's going to be like good for China, the CCP or Putin or whatever. It's distressing to pe- to me to see people promoting like the, the, the UAE's structure of government as superior to the American structure of government. I really think this is important. Like the, the way forward is to reform liberal democracies and improve them. It's not to give up on the idea of limited government power and go simp for some authoritarian. Mm-hmm. This is just very distressing. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know. I don't know if you've seen that, but I, it, it just really irks well, me. Absolutely. And it, it, it gets at different understandings and conceptions of freedom. Um, and this has been a problem as long as we have recorded history. Like in, in the ancient world, we often saw two different um, conceptions of freedom expressed in various legal, social, spiritual texts. One conception of freedom, actually in, in the English-speaking world, so the word freedom in English comes from an old Germanic word for friend. Um, and so it is, you are free when you are a fully self-responsible, morally autonomous individual capable of friendship with others. You know, if you're a slave, if you're in a relation of subjugation, um, you have a much more limited capacity to do that. You can't freely enter into contracts, transact. Um, Your moral autonomy is always circumscribed. And so you can't be free. Um, In the Roman tradition, however, um, in the late Republic, we start to see a definition of freedom that increasingly means the power of the Lord, the Dominus, to dispose however he will with his private property. And that pro- property includes the people who are part of his household, including his slaves, his children, <laughs> his women. Yeah. Um, and so in the medieval period, for example, it was common to speak of the liberty of the gallows, which was every lord's right to have their own private execution station um, where they would execute people. And so there's, I think, a tension um, always politically between those who see freedom as their license to amass however much power they want personally and then behave with full impunity within their sphere of ownership. 
versus a freedom that respects the moral autonomy of others and sees my part in the social world as um, a relation of respect and morality with you. Um, and some those, those competing definitions of freedom have been calcified from time to time in political ideologies, but I think that's done a disservice because neither the left nor the right um, actually uh, has a monopoly on either one of these definitions. They sort of slip between them based on who they think the good guy is. Um, and so I would suggest that a self-consistent morality and political philosophy actually emerges from this descriptive sense of a, a commitment to individual moral autonomy universally for everyone, regardless of station or background. And that has to remain our compass. Like, yeah. Look, I mean, I, I would challenge, um, you know, any of the critics out there who are, you know, and, you know, typical anti-American types uh, who, you know, are simping for some dictator. I mean, I doubt they've written a more devastating criticism of the American state and project than that book that's sitting in front of you. Mm -hmm. um, but what you have to understand is that the answer is not to give up on, again, limited government power and personal freedoms. Right in exchange for law and order uh, statism. That's not the answer. Mm -hmm. The police state is not the answer. The police state's the enemy. So yeah. like, let's make sure America doesn't become more like a police state. Let's not give up on the American idea and project and go <clears throat> live in, in Dubai and praise, you know, an, an absolute monarchy. I mean, that that's going back in time. Um, mm -hmm. That's more primitive. Like we need to find ways to protect personal freedom. We need to find ways to make the American project less vampiric on, on poor countries. And I think we can do that by reforming our currency, to be honest. Like it will just happen over time if, if, if what we see in the world starts to, or continues to happen with Bitcoin becoming a bigger and bigger piece of the global economy. This uh, sympathy for dictators is something I've personally found particularly troubling. And, and, and thank you for speaking up on this, Peter, by the way, you've been a, a big voice here on this. And I want to come back to Bacali and discuss it with you because that's one I that's one I, I struggle <laughs> yeah, with. But I've, sure. I've, I've particularly been troubled by the same people who call me a status cuck simping for dictators. It's definitely the same crowd. They, there's an overlap, certainly. Oh, between do, them. the people calling you a statist are are typically uh, lionizing actual statists. Mm -hmm. That's the moral inconsistency here. Yeah. Like like as yeah. long as they're look if they're willing to say Putin is evil. Um, Ukraine is not a fake nation. In fact, it's democracies older than the United States. Um, if they're willing to say the CCP is committing genocide, and if they're willing to say that only 10% of the population of the UAE are actual citizens, and that the whole thing is built on basically servitude and, and forced labor, um, then we can have a conversation. If they're not willing to say those things, then you know that, that they're just hiding. Well, I've run into it a couple of times recently. So I've run into it on Twitter yesterday, um, uh, with Zuby, and I like Zuby. I think Zuby's an interesting guy. Says mm -hmm. some interesting things, mm -hmm. but um, and I think I'm pretty sure he's talking about Saudi Arabia. But he's uh, he, oh, and, and more broadly, I mean, he was saying if you have to pay twenty to sixty percent of all your money, uh, you enter the government or go to jail, then you know you're free. Mm -hmm. And I was troubled by that because. Yeah, you know, my response to him was saying, well, there are places where you pay 0% tax, but you can go to jail for criticizing the government. Sure. Right. They pay tax here. So it's kind of pick your poison. Um, but he also discussed the idea, like you brought up a lot of 0% uh, uh, statistics in relation to Saudi Arabia, like the crime rates, et cetera, et cetera. Sure. But left out other uh, statistics that are really important. And the nuance has been lost sometimes for people to make a specific argument with with skewed data or one data set, but not the whole picture. And I've become particularly troubled, troubled by it. And I don't understand how some people can have such conflicting views. Well, it's, it shouldn't be. Uh, I know it confusing. shouldn't be. Confusing, like a police state has low crime rate. Like, like, look at how much petty crime do you think happens in Xinjiang, where the Chinese government is committing Probably genocide? close to zero. Very low. Um, how much petty crime do you think happens in Saudi Arabia uh, or in, uh, I, I don't know, like, you know, Pyongyang in North Korea, very, very, very low. The state has a total monopoly on violence in these countries and exerts it at its, you know, without any impunity whatsoever. So, you know, and to the El Salvador point, it, it's entirely true. You can make a safer society by decreasing the amount of freedom that people have. That's mm -hmm. entirely accurate. I mean, there, there are 
problems with that model, certainly, which is one of the reasons I don't, I don't think it's a, a good model because it actually, it, over time, it can increase terrorism and it can, can, can increase violent opposition to the government if you crack down too hard. You see this in, in many, many, many countries. Um, but ultimately, it comes down to what do you stand for? If you wanna come out and say that you are okay with sacrificing liberty for security, and, and you wanna be consistent with that, that's totally fine. The problem is with people who are like LARPing for freedom, who are okay sacrificing liberty for security. Those people are just hypocrites. Yeah, so the El Salvador one I, I find tricky because I, I agree with everything you're saying. And at the same time, I've visited the country. Sure. And it, you know, it is still a democratic nation. I know he's shifted the constitution to run again, but I'm saying it's still a democratic nation. He is popular. He has dealt with a specific, very, very bad problem of gangs. And he has shifted that. He's also well, he's also challenging. But remember, democracy is just not about voting. I know, I know. Just bear with me. He, he, he has also challenged the IMF and the World Bank. He's run up against them, which is a good thing. Yes, they can, do. Can there ever be a... Uh, a middle ground where some a, a, a benevolent dictator can improve the country and then restore maybe some of the yeah the uh, institutions that he broke down. Have can this happen? What do you think? Um, I think it's necessary actually. So the act of founding something is a dictatorial act. You okay. don't you don't ask permission to fight a revolution to found the United States of America. You get your people together and you, through violence, instantiate a new political reality. But the question is then what do you do after that? Once your republic is founded, do you build the institutions that then can hold and steward this new political reality without reference to any specific political personality? Or do you create a cult of personality that you then subordinate all of the structures of government to, to create an ongoing dependency on your particular self. That's Bukele, what she just said. Exactly, and that's what I worry. I mean, my, my biggest question for him, if I, if I got the, to interview him again, would be, what next? And, and right. Venezuelans can tell you this because they lived through this, but like, Chavez was enormously popular. Democracy, like at least properly understood in my perspective, I know that everybody's got a different perspective on democracy. Yeah. It literally just means rule by the people in Greek. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it, it could be however you want to take it. But I prefer to look at it as liberal democracy, which has which marries rule of law with free and fair elections. I mean, that's what I think is the best way to govern in, in today's world. Um, and what Bukele is doing is he's um, continuing to have elections but he is, he's, he's destroying the rule of law and he's removing all checks on his power and, and eventually the elections won't be fair. Mm. Um, you are gonna have a, a tough time in, in El Salvador today if you're very critical of the government, which is why a lot of people just self-censor. Mm. Um, and even people I know down there are just, they're like, yeah, we're, we're not gonna speak out too much about the government. That would cause problems. Like people know what's happening. I've and, been and again, that might be worth the trade off but don't pretend like you're a freedom maximalist. Like if you're okay with locking up tens of thousands of people without due process, I will I will accept that argument to to, to increase public order and safety. But but you cannot be LARPing as a freedom maximalist anymore. You are now a law and order Republican. Um, go for it. You know. I mean, I've been I've been there and I've been in protests. Yeah. And people can openly protest in a way you can't in maybe other countries. That's true. I was with you at one. Yeah. So, so but that was two years ago. We'll see. Um, yeah. So, uh, but, but, but that's my question. <laughs> it gets is, worse over time is my point. Of course. And I know yeah. the trajectory. And that's why my biggest yeah. questions are is, you know, what happens to the constitution now? Is it a third election, fourth election? I actually felt like the job can't be done in five He's years. He's ripping it up. He's going to run again. Uh, yeah. Even though it says in the constitution, he can't. Of course. But yeah. like, yeah. And maybe that's his version of, you know, a revolution is doing it from within inside the government. Mm -hmm. Yeah, or I, FDR. Yeah. I mean, the United States. He served a third time, didn't he? Did he yeah. serve a fourth? Yes, fourth? but it wasn't on. Con it did, it, we didn't change that law until after him. But I would right. agree, oh. FDR's re re regime right. was terrible. For actually, especially when it comes to money and how he ruined <laughs> the money standard in the United States. Yeah, and I mean, back in those days, you uh, 
even the government stated more plainly what things were. So during the sec- Second World War, FDR established an office of censorship. That's literally what it was called. And it it specified very clearly what the rules were for journalists writing about the war. Um, you can write about these topics. You can't write about these topics. And um, the press uh, largely complied. Um, they They followed these rules. The only ma- major exception was when they started to break the story of Los Alamos. Um, they didn't They didn't know what was happening there. They started writing about it. Um, but, and so this, this gets at the question of what is sovereignty? Um, so the Nazi political theorist Carl Schmitt famously defined sovereignty in the 1930s as he is sovereign who decides on the state of exception. So there's the rule of law, and then there are exceptions. Who decides? The sovereign. Um, and the Schmidt's attraction to the Nazi party at that time was that he saw it as the, the personal dictator, um, as the only way to break through the inability of parliament, of the Weimar parliament, to get anything meaningful done. Um, and so there is... There is a kind of overlap between, you know, the the desire for the the personal authority of the great man um, and authoritarianism, but they don't necessarily have to overlap. For example, like uh, any uh, company is a hierarchical enterprise. Um, it is not a democracy. Um, it is often led by, you know, ineffective dictator, a chief executive officer um, who makes decisions and and is takes responsibility for the direction of the firm. If you tried to, you know, do commercial enterprises as direct democracies, and this has been tried many times, there are certain limitations you run into really quickly. And so what does that mean? Hierarchy is a social technology. The military functions from hierarchy because you're not going to deliberate in the field, in the battlefield over every little thing. You have to uh, have an executive decision and implement it. Um, and so this is one of the reasons that um, I'm, I'm doing work in anthropology again, is because I think people have a lot of categories that are conflated, where they're like seeing Bukele as Elon Musk, as Donald Trump, as, you know, like Victor Orban and like, that they're conflating different structures of government, different mm-hmm. corporate mm. forms, and they don't have a coherent theory of how all this holds together and what these different forms do. I would also just add that I would make a call or a plea for nuance. Like, obviously, I'm very critical of Bukele's governing style, and I'm concerned mm-hmm. about it. But I think it's awesome that he adopted Bitcoin for the country. I think it's a great move. I think it's awesome that he's trying to challenge the IMF. I, I would maybe would contest just how much he's challenging it, given that they're still participating in all these programs and they're a dollarized country, right? Um, but uh, but I think it's cool to experiment with volcano bonds, renewables. I, I think with FDR, it's it's worth pointing out that he did a lot of very, very positive things. He also stole the savings of America to fund the New Deal, like nuance. I think RFK Jr. has some interesting positions. I also think he has some bad ones. Like he, mm-hmm. think, he thinks the Ukraine war is a NATO proxy war. Like he's, that's crazy. So he has crazy positions. He has good ones. We've become, we've entered into a culture where like, if I share a link about RFK Jr., I mean, I get can, I'll get i get canceled by like a lot of people on like in the centrist center left. Um, I've seen this happen before. And th- this is what happened with Ron Paul 15, 20 years ago, right? Um, or even more recently than that. Uh, again, I don't agree with Ron Paul's, all of his positions, but he had some really good ones. Um, but if I were to like say, oh, I think Ron Paul's thing on this is good, immediately people associate with you, him, you know, you with all of their positions. So I just think nuance is very important, and that that brings us back to the book. I mean, I I think that it's about nuance. It's about being able to tell the difference between uh, features of the American system, the global system, that are exploitative, and features that are good. Mm-hmm. And it's about us working together to try to reduce exploitation and improve cooperation. And and I think that giving up on the project of America um, just because it has had bad externalities is not a good idea. I think we need to work to correct those externalities. By the way, I, I got uh, Danny to bring me the book because it was a bit I wanted to read earlier. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm going to be jumping Go around yeah, because yeah. I, we're going to finish up soon. Sure. But this was my favorite bet. The IMF basically exists to prevent the free market from working as it normally would. It bails out countries that would normally go bankrupt, forcing them instead deeper into debt. 
The IMF makes the impossible possible. Small countries hold so much debt, they can never pay it all off. And me and De Danny were like, the IMF is like a global Fed. Well, we now, actually the Fed, I mean, again, all the, there are a lot of important financial institutions. I'd argue the IMF and World Bank are, are very important, but the Fed, you know, might take the cake. And um, the Fed has these things called swap lines, which are just bail, basically they're bailouts for our allies. Mm. Uh, when there is a crisis in Japan, <laughs> or in France or something like that, we can establish a swap line so that those countries can exchange different kinds of financial collateral for, for US treasuries or dollars, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so they can, they can basically take their assets, which are trading at like 60 cents on the dollar, and, and we, we'll take them for, for something that's worth a dollar. Like it's basically the BTFP program, but globally, like mm -hmm. some of these swap line type things. So we're willing to do that to like, keep our political allies uh, more stable. Um, and, and in a way it's sort of similar to, to what the way IMF bails out countries with the major exception that the Fed does not impose conditionality on these countries because our allies, our wealthy allies, we're never gonna get structural adjustment. Like this is, I mean, not gonna happen. I mean, in fact, in the UK right now, what there's a price cap on energy, right? Or very recently. Yep. That would never happen in a country that's being structurally adjusted. No, they get rid of the price cap and you, it goes through the roof and then you just don't have electricity. That's what happens <laughs> in a country like Egypt. I mean, yep. it's just- Done. It, no, it's just like a price. <laughs> I mean, if it got bad enough in the UK, they would put a price cap on bread, for example. A hundred percent, that would totally happen. Yet in Egypt today, because it's being currently structurally adjusted by the IMF, a country that's larger than Britain, by the way, um, there is no price cap on bread and it's, skyrocketing in price and um it that's it, just it's just sad and mm -hmm. um there's there's not a whole lot that like you and i and we can do about it now this system again the incentives are such that it keeps going the ponzi keeps growing the debt trap keeps growing and countries keep falling into deeper and deeper uh, subservience to, to the Western powers or to China. I mean, China's got its own uh, system going. So I think the only way you break this is with cha changing the monetary paradigm. I really do think as Bitcoin grows over the next few decades and becomes a bigger piece of the puzzle, that a lot of this becomes unsustainable and, and ends. And that, that gives me a lot of hope. If the US stopped doing this, would this leave a vacuum which China would fill? It's hard for China to fill it. I mean, they've tried. Like China has lent enormous amounts of money to the to the to the developing world. Um, the problem is China doesn't mint the reserve currency. So when a country goes bankrupt or can't pay China back, there's like it's just a big problem. Like China can like seize collateral. It can like take over a telecom or something, but like it doesn't necessarily want to do that. So they're they're having a lot of problems with their lending program, and it's stalling. It's like slowing down. Meanwhile, ours are ramping up because we can just do paperwork. Like thirty billion dollars to. Brazil for us is paperwork. For the Chinese, $30 billion to Indonesia is not paperwork. That's like a big deal. So, so they, they're gonna encounter issues because they don't have the same kind of privilege we have. Um, but it doesn't mean that, that they won't try. Until, in, until, again, until or if we do move to something like a Bitcoin standard, <clears throat> these structures will continue to, to perpetrate because this is what you can do with fiat currency. Tell uh, Alex about the HSBC ad you saw at the airport. Oh shit! Yeah, I think it was HSBC, or maybe it was Santander. It was it was a big bank on mm -hmm. the airport in Australia mm -hmm. when I was on the way here. Mm -hmm. And on the walkway down to the plane where they have all the posters, yeah, at the bottom right hand corner it said supporting the Air Belt and Road Initiative. Oof! Yeah, like, yeah. like they're Oof. advertising that like it's a good thing. Yeah, and that, like trust me, like the, like the Chinese lending scheme is even worse than the IMF's and World Bank. It, it, it's higher interest rates, more exploitative, and. You know, you know that that's bad news. Again, I, I don't want to fall into this trap of like criticizing America and then and then boosting its enemies. Like, I think we need to be equal opportunity critics and criticize what needs to be criticized. I, I mean, the, again, the number of people who who will make arguments like mine, but then go turn around and 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 simp for some dictator is is the majority of people. Honestly, um, they loved Hugo Chavez. They loved uh, you know maybe they love Putin. Um, it's it's just very very sad. So I'm asking for us to just be consistent, uh, consistent anti-authoritarian here, and if we cr are willing to call out America's uh, crimes and 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 bad behavior, then you certainly shouldn't remain silent about about the the UAEs or or, or uh, Singapore's or uh, China's or, or anyone else. Okay. So what now? What do we do? Like, what is the action on this? I think, like for me. It's doing whatever I can to just continue to support Bitcoin adoption. I mean, if you okay. look at the data, like the countries that got structurally adjusted, 
uh, the most, these like big, meaty, industrial, global South countries like Argentina, Nigeria, Pakistan, um, uh, Turkey, Brazil, Indonesia, like those are the countries that have like gotten the sort of roughest part of this treatment. They have the highest rates of Bitcoin and cryptocurrency adoption in the world. Pakistan has just banned crypto. Did I? That's a stress end effect. If you, <laughs> that's not going to work. Like, yeah. We've seen that before. Yeah. Uh, look at Nigeria. So um, look at Argentina. Like yeah. basically these bigger industrial uh, global South countries, they have really high rates of Bitcoin and cryptocurrency adoption. Um, so I, it's interesting. People are escaping. I think inarguably, Bitcoin allows individuals to escape from the system in a way that they couldn't 30 or 40 years ago. Like if you were being structurally adjusted in Peru in the 1980s, like the, you were stuck. You only had your local fiat currency. There was no internet, digital international financial system for you to escape into. Today, there is. On, on your phone, you can, you can escape. Okay, and that, that's a big deal. What we don't know, and that's worth pursuing and celebrating. It can help individuals get out of the, that trap. We don't know if, it can get, if, if nations can get out of it. We don't know what that's going to look like. But I mean, it's worth thinking about, I, in my opinion. All right. Uh before we close out, Natalie, do you have any final comments? Because I think we're going to head out to the conference. Yeah. Um, so in the ancient world, pretty much every revolutionary program can be summarized as cancel the debt and redistribute the land. Um, so debt jubilees became routinized, you know, every 7, 10, 15 years, whenever a new sovereign took over. Um, because the levels of debt would become so unsustainable and the social, I mean, these were slavery societies. So if you couldn't pay your debts, um, your, you know, children were enslaved or your wife was enslaved um, or your land was seized and now you're landless or you personally were enslaved. Um, and so in order to prevent actual violence, um, rulers had to kind of do a reset every once in a while. Um, our last big reset was the Second World War. And we no longer have debt cancellation as a political program in any country anywhere in the world. Um, and so my concern is while Bitcoin is a sound money standard, it is not a program of debt cancellation. It is not a program to redistribute any wealth. Um, Bitcoin is just a form of sound collateral. Um, and the vast majority of people are going to have very little Bitcoin because they're going to have very little money in general. <laughs> um, and so we actually have to look at the destabilizing effects that such large amounts of debt have on the, on the societies of the world. And my fear is that if we don't actually adopt some program of debt cancellation, um, then we're going to create war uh, to cancel that debt. Hmm. Okay. Um, <laughs> it's kind of a sad end really isn't it <laughs> um, okay well listen look Alex another brilliant book um, Hit of Repression How the IMF and the World Bank Sell Exploitation as Development it's mm -hmm. available everywhere is there an audio book coming soon coming soon uh, get it on Bitcoin Magazine store or on Amazon great go and get the book uh, also check out Alex's previous book Check Your Financial Privilege we will link Thanks, both buddy. in the show notes and whatever Natalie writes over this next year or two definitely check that out as well <laughs> love you both thank you both for this uh, really appreciate it and continue <laughs> your amazing work thank you thank you Peter. thank you